I am blessed, aren't you? God has been talking to me about blessing lately, and so I want to talk about this. He's really been challenging me to take on some things in my life and, and change the way I've been um, perceiving things, uh, speaking about things, and just acting upon things. So I want to share that with you today because God is a blesser, and we see that from the very beginning. Let's read a couple scriptures. Genesis 1.28 says, Then God blessed them, speaking of Adam and Eve, and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over everything that moves on the earth. <clears throat> then we see, after God finished creation on the seventh day, that God blessed the seventh day. He sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which he had created and made. That's in Genesis 2-3. Then when Abraham comes on the scene in Genesis 12, he says, God said to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you. See, God wants us to be blessed. And I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. James 3.10 says that blessing and cursing shouldn't come out of the same mouth. So we see that God wants us to be blessed. It was so important that he blessed man from the beginning. Don't you think that just being created by God would be enough? But it wasn't enough. He actually blessed man through Adam and Eve, and he blessed the work of his hands, God blessing his own creation. And I, I have come to the realization that I am blessed. I'm not trying to get blessed. For you see, I realized that in the Garden of Eden, and the enemy always tempts us this way. He tries to make us think that we don't have or we need to get something that we don't have. And he tried that with Eve. We see that in um, uh, Genesis 3, 5, that Satan came to Eve and he said to her, God knows in the day that you eat it, the fruit that he was offering, the fruit that God had said, don't eat of it, but the uh, all the other fruit and all the other trees, he said, you may freely eat, but of the one tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he said, you shall not eat. And Satan says, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil in Genesis 3, 5 but they were already like God. They were created in, him, in his image. Uh, they were clothed in his glory, which is why they didn't know they were naked. How do I know this? Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Adam and Eve at this time had not sinned. So therefore they weren't short of the glory of God. They were clothed in his glory. And this is why they didn't recognize or pay attention to the fact that they were naked because it was inconsequential. So wasn't that, wasn't that great knowledge that they came to from the fact that they took of the fruit that their eyes were open to see what was good and evil. God didn't want us to live that way. Let me take a side trip here. God didn't want us to live by the fact of what we know is good and evil. God wanted us to live by his direction. And therefore, God would have always told us good things to do. He would have always instructed us in the way of righteousness. So he would have always been saying good things. And there are many things that come to us today that we might think are good, but there are things that take away from us. And so therefore, he didn't want us to have the burden of knowing good and evil. He just was going to show us the good. And so we see how the enemy wanted to bring mankind down, but he works the same way in our life. He comes to us and tries to uh, point out with the circumstances in our lives, you're not blessed. You must be cursed because of this, that, and the other. And, and show, he can show you all the proof of that. But I'm going to show you by the word of God that we are all 
already blessed. I'm not going to be blessed. I already am blessed. And I'm going to walk in that. And then I'm going to see the manifestation of the blessing. It's like when we look at the trees. Can you see the wind? No, you don't see the wind. You see the result of the wind in the trees. But the wind is blowing all the time. The wind is blowing in the upper atmosphere. The wind is blowing, but we can't see it because unless a tree is bending or the bushes are moving or uh, fabric is blowing in the wind or something is moving, we don't know that the wind is moving. We see it at the beach when you go to the seashore. In the morning, it could be that the wind is less and so that the ocean is much more calm and peaceful. But as the day goes on and the wind starts whipping up, the waves become greater. And we see evidence of that in hurricanes and tornadoes and all that thing. Of You see the manifestation of the wind. So... Uh, we're tempted, the enemy tr tempts us to, to be better, to become self-sufficient, that we take it in our own hands. I got to be better at what I am. I got to get more of what I got. And I, and, and is always pushing, pushing, which is causing stress and anxiousness and striving. And that's not the way that God wants us to live. Um, let's look at Jesus when he went to, when the 5,000 came and he was going to feed them. Um, he said 5,000 men and, well, men to be fed. So there was more than likely more of that there with women and children. And so what do we have? And the disciples brought him five loaves and two fish. Now, Jesus didn't say, oh, look at this, look. Look at all these people. That is not enough. And he throws it to the ground. And he's like, oh, if I just had competent disciples, if I just had somebody that could see, and it was obvious that this was enough, they wouldn't even bother me. They wouldn't even waste my time. But that wasn't Jesus' response because Jesus didn't minister in stress. <laughs> Jesus knew who he was. He knew the spirit of God that he was filled with, that greater was God that was in him than anything going on in the natural. So Jesus didn't get flustered. He just worked it. So let's see what Jesus did. 5,000 people sat down. They brought him the loaves and the fishes. And let's see what it says. In Luke 9, 16 and 17, it says, He took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven... He blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. So they all ate and were filled. And 12 baskets of leftover fragments were taken up by them. Jesus received it and he blessed it. He gave it to the disciples to give out. I don't believe that at that time that it multiplied because the disciples couldn't have carried enough food for 5,000 people. I believe that it went and that somebody would take something off, then it would multiply. And the next person came, they would take more off. They would take more off. And they might have looked at the end of one row and go, oh, it's getting low. And they pass it over and they get to the end of the next row. And it has the same amount that it had in the row before them, and yet they fed 25 more people or 100 more people. I believe that it multiplied. And when they were done, that young man that gave up his five loaves and two fish, maybe he was an entrepreneur. Maybe he'd showed up, ooh, there's a crown out there. I see the opportunity to make some money. And so he brought the five loaves and two fish. Let's just venture to say it was one basket. But when it was done, he had... 12 basketfuls left over. But not only was there more than enough, it tells us in Luke 9, 17, that they all ate and were filled. There is no indication that Jesus said, okay, as you take this, now be very careful, instruct the people just to take a, a little tiny bit because we want it. There was no instruction. There was no warning. There was no fear that was communicated by Jesus that there wasn't going to be enough. He just said, give it. Now, you know, there's always going to be people that are going to take more, particularly if you got a kid. You know, if I take, if when my children were little and we go to the cafeteria, you know, they that's just overwhelming, too many choices, and they want more, and so they would get more food than they could eat. 
And so, you know, there's people that are going to be afraid that they would. Maybe some people were so poor it was the only meal they were going to eat all day long. So they were hungry. So they were taking it. They'd been out in the sunshine. They were, um, uh, it was coming on to evening. So they probably were, you know, ready for something to fill their stomach. And so they took what they needed for them and their family. And they all ate, it says, and they were filled. They didn't just get a bite. They were filled. This is the way that God operates. God gives, and he gives more than enough. He wants you to have left over. Um, my mom tells a story when I was growing up. We, uh, she was going to fix uh, dinner for our family, and a singing group was coming to our church uh, that evening. And so she asked them, when she talked to them early in the day, are you going to be here for dinner? Because I can feed you. Oh, no, no, we'll be fine. We're not, Don't worry about us. Well, we were just sitting down to dinner when the bus rolled up and this large group of people got out. So my mother was not prepared. They had told her they wouldn't need to eat. And she said, when they came in, she said, would y'all like something? Oh, yeah, we're ready to eat. Well, my mom goes out in the backyard and she said, Lord, you're going to have to multiply this. I do not have what I need to feed this many people. And do you know she had spaghetti that night? That what she normally fed our family of four, which was my mom and dad and my brother and I, and we would have been young. We would have been first grade and younger. I would have been first grade and my brother would have been younger than that. Do you, not, do you realize that all of the people were fed Everyone had enough to eat. God multiplied spaghetti. So the things that we see in the scriptures are not just for that time. Wasn't that wonderful that Jesus did that? Yes, it was. But it's also an example that if God did that with Jesus, he also wants to do that in and through and for me. I just have to believe God, trust God, and, and act upon that. So... This habit, having lack is a very common problem. It wasn't just something that Jesus ran into, but we see it in the Old Testament as well. Many times over, but I'm going to reference one scripture in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. A widow woman came to Elisha, and she was in debt, and her sons were going to be sold to pay the debt if she didn't come up with the money. So Elisha says, um, what do you have? And she says, all I have is a little oil. Didn't matter. He didn't groan and go, oh, I wish it was something else. Didn't matter. He instructed her, go borrow vessels, not a few. Go, buy a lot, go borrow a lot of vessels. Buy every container you can find. Borrow from your neighbors and bring it. And begin to pour out the oil. And she did. She poured and she poured and she poured. She had a little oil now. But every time another container was put there, the oil pour, poured into it and filled it up. And then when she finished the last container, she goes, okay, what's next? And they said, we filled up everything that we can find. The oil stopped. The oil stopped. So the woman then was able to take the oil and pay off the debt. And, and they were taken care of. But it's more than enough. The debt was paid. Her sons were saved. They weren't saved. She was a widow, widow woman. She needed those sons uh, to, to help her and, and uh, provide for her and all those kind of things. So the sons were paid off and they lived on the rest. It was more than enough. God is interested in you more than your current situation. He's interested in your future. He's interested in everything going on in your life. So it is not wrong to expect and believe that God can do above and beyond and more than what we are asking for. Um, I believe I've told this story before, but my oldest daughter was going to her um, third year of school. My middle daughter was going to start her first year of school. And so a prophetic word came to my daughter and said um, that whatever was in her heart to do, the provision was there. 
Well, she was about to decide that she wasn't going to go back to school because the money wasn't there. My middle daughter was going to go because she had scholarships for first and second semester of her freshman year. And um, I had told her that if we didn't have enough money that she'd had two years of school and now her sister was going to have to go. So I asked her what she wanted to do and she said, well, I really would like to go back to school. And I said, fine. God said whatever's in your heart to do, the provision's there. So I'm like, okay, God, you said that. We got about a month. Nothing happened. Then it came three weeks. And I'm like, God, we got three weeks. Nothing happened. We started gathering all the stuff and we started packing the cars and we started getting ready together and we're getting ready to leave. And it was my car was full of stuff. My oldest daughter's car was full of stuff and my middle daughter's car was full of stuff. So we were all driving. So all the way on the way to school, I kept saying, and the worry would start to come in. I'm, I'm not going there. And so, um, Lord, you said that whatever were her, was in her heart to do, the provision was there. It's in her heart to go to school and to go to school now, not wait five years, now. And uh, you said the provision was there. I am not going to worry. Now, just to be on the safe side, I had received some checks from a credit card company saying that they would... Um, uh, you know, loan money with no interest for nine months. And I thought, well, if I get in a bind, I've got that and we can use that. So, but that wasn't the way I wanted to go because God said he would provide. Well, when we got to the school, their dad came and he took them to the business office and a provision had been made that they were able to have tuition exchange 100%. 100% of their tuition as long as they were in school was going to be paid. Is that not phenomenal? Is that not the blessing of the Lord? But let's go. It's not just enough for my oldest daughter. It also included my middle daughter who was starting out, but it also will go as far as my youngest daughter and take care of her. It went above and beyond. It was more than enough. God is great and more than enough is no greater to him than to supply the need. So praise God. I have that and we, I have many more examples. Is that why I believe? Well, it does help to have uh, uh, examples in your life that it had happened. But you know what? I believe it because the word says. And you know, the enemy works over time that whenever God comes through in our life, he wants to make it seem like, oh, it was just something natural. God wasn't in it. And so we can begin to doubt it. So every time I come to a situation to believe, I have to believe afresh again for that situation and not just go, well, you know, he did it last time. I know he do it that way. No big deal. No, fear and worry will begin to try to come in again. And I have to stand on the same word that I stood on before. God, your word says you supply all of our need according to your riches and glory and believe what he has said. Several weeks ago, um, in I believe my last teaching, or one of the last several teachings, I talked about Jehovah Jireh, who is the many-breasted one. And I talked about how when uh, a mother has a child, that that body begins to produce milk for that child. And when the mother, even unconsciously, if she hears that baby crying, that milk begins to, uh, to be produced in her body and to drip from her breast and is ready for that child to latch on. And there, as long as that child will nurse, that supply will be there. As long as the child will nurse, the supply is there. But if that child begins to take less and less milk and then gets weaned from that, that mother's milk will dry up. But in olden days, and they may do it now, I'm just not familiar with it, if when a woman had a baby and then her baby's weaned out, but weaned off, but maybe another baby needed mother's milk, that maybe something happened to the mother, the mother's milk didn't come in, that mother could become a wet nurse to someone else's child. This could go on for years. As long as children would be drinking at that mother's breast, the supply was there. God is the many-breasted one. He wants us and he has provision for all of us more than enough. But the minute that we start cutting back, the minute that we stop demanding, and when I say demanding, I'm not, you know, banging on the desk. You've got to do this. I'm not saying that. But the, the minute that I stop having a need and expecting him to, to fulfill, it dries up. 
But God, I, I heard someone the other day talking about that God had given me that example, and then I heard someone else talking about it, and then they went further than that. And this is true, that if a mother cannot uh, uh, dispense the milk that, that comes into her body, if she's not able for a child to drink it or, or to pump it, that her, she becomes engorged and it's painful to her. So if you get that picture of God, it becomes painful to him not to be able to give to us. He loves to give. He is a giver. That is his nature always and always will be. So God wants opportunity to show himself faithful to us. If God did not withhold his only son, then what else could be more important that he would withhold from us? Would it be finances? No, finances aren't more important than his only begotten son. Would it be health? No, that's not more important than his only begotten son. So because he did not withhold Jesus, there is nothing else that he would withhold from us. So are you in any kind of lack in your life? A lack in finances, a lack in relationships, a lack in health. Whatever that we may be coming short in, God has abundance for us. I have become aware that sometimes I am a um, back believer. <laughs> what do I mean by that? I mean that I believe it after it happens. Well, it takes no faith to believe for something after it happens. I have to believe what the Word of God says and believe it now. It tells us in Mark 11, chapter, uh, excuse me, Mark 11, chapter, verse 24, that I'm going to pray and believe. Let me read it to you. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe that you receive them and ye shall have them. So when have I received them? When I pray. Not when it shows up in the manifestation, but I receive it when I've prayed. How do I know that? How do I know that I can get that? Because 1 John 5 or 14 and 15 says, This is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. Do you hear that? If we ask anything according to God's will, He hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. It says this is the confidence that if we ask anything according to his will, we know he hears us. And we know that if he hears us, that he's going to, put, he's going to give us the petitions that we have brought before him. Confidence in God that he wants to give me something and answer my prayer. I must admit, for too long of a time, I think that I subconsciously, now on the outside I would have told you no, I didn't believe this, but subconsciously I was believing that uh, God wanted me to jump through hoops and do everything I could to prove to him that I was good enough to receive the answers and then he would give it to me. I did not truly believe deep down in my heart that God was a giver and wanted to give to me. I mean, I have all kinds of proof. This, that, and the other didn't happen, and blah, 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 and I go down the line of, you know, what? But I find that I would pray, and then I would, um, okay, then I'm going to continue to believe, or I continue to go get prayer for it over and over and over. If I call um, Sears, and I order something online, and they said, uh, and I pay for it, and they say, thank you, um, it will be in the mail or a truck will deliver it in three days. Then I call up tomorrow and I say, you know what? I want to order and I order the very same thing. And they said, okay. And then I call up the next day and I go, I haven't believed that they've received my order. I haven't believed them when they've told me that it was on a truck. And so I realized that I have to believe what the word of God says that I believe that it's done for me now, I receive it now, and the manifestation is on the way. We're, I'm going to read some scriptures in a few minutes. It's going to tell us how we know that we're blessed 
what things are going on in our life that tell us that we're blessed. We're not going, hoping to get blessed. We already are blessed. And so we're going to receive what God has for us. Are you lacking in finances? Are you lacking in health? Are you lacking in any way? Then this is what we need to do. We need to bless it, just like Jesus did. Bless your paycheck. Bless that Social Security check. Bless that inheritance. Bless that workman's comp check. Bless that uh, whatever check you're getting, a pension. Whatever finances you have, bless it. Bless it. In the name of Jesus, bless it and ask God to multiply it, to meet the need. If you have enough, bless what you have and ask God to multiply it to meet the need for taxes, to meet the need for inflation. I have never seen gasoline change prices as quickly as it does, as it has in the last couple of years. I mean, it used to go up one cent, but now overnight it'll go up five or ten cents. It's amazing. But we bless what we have, we've got something. Just like when Jesus was brought the five loaves and two fish, he had something to work with. And so God wants our faith to work with, and we have something in our account, so we bless it. We bless it in the name of Jesus. We ask God to multiply it, that as we break it, meaning as we give it out, as I send out the light bill, as I pay the mortgage, as I put gas in my car, as I go buy groceries, that God multiplies it, that there's enough left over that I have to give to the poor, that there's enough left over that I can go out to dinner, that there's enough left over that I can invite friends over and we can enjoy fellowship. We bless it and ask God to multiply it. What about if you're, um, you don't like your body? Again, he said to Abraham, in blessing I will bless you and I will bless those that curse you. When I am get anxious about something, I don't like this. Ooh, I don't like it. It's like I cast it aside. It's not cursing per se, but, but I disregarded it. I'm, I count it as nothing, and it's not going to be to my advantage. I'm going to try to ignore it and disregard it. Um, let's say I didn't like my personality, and so I, I just disregarded uh, who I was and how I was created, and I try to be like someone else, and I'm acting out this way to be somebody because I feel like that's not good enough because the devil's going to tell me what I've got is not enough that I need to be fruitful in life and to accomplish everything God has for me. Lies, lies, lies. What if instead of discarding it, disregarding it as if nothing, that I begin to bless it? Lord, I bless my personality. You created me to be everything I needed to be for the life and the destiny that you have for me. I bless it that I will blossom. I bless my personality that it grows and that it can be kind and generous to others. And I begin to bless that thing and see what God will do. If it's not what it needs it to, to be, then God can change it and make something different. We bless it. What if I had, um, I was going to bless my skin, but let's say I had boils on my skin. I was like a Job, or I had some kind of lesions, or I had something. If I bless my skin, is that going to bless the bad? No, blessing does not bless the bad. Blessing blesses the good to increase, to diminish, or to, st or to dist uh, uh, extinguish the bad. So if I had a boil on my skin and I bless my skin, my skin becomes so healthy that that boil dries up and goes away and my skin is blessed. And so every day I'm, I'm finding myself in these last several weeks as God has been talking to me about blessing, that I get up and say, God, this day is blessed before you. My steps are blessed as I'm going out. I'm not trying to get there. I'm not looking for the proof. I'm walking in the confidence that I'm already there. I wanna tell you, I've begun to see already um, answers to that blessing on, on uh, my uh, paycheck or my wallet. When I bless that, that um, I've seen checks come in the mail. I've seen uh, money be given to me. I've seen things happen. I've, I've seen money multiplied where I shouldn't be able to do something and the money's there to do it because I'm blessing it and I'm seeing God multiply it.
It's, it's miraculous. It's wonderful. This is what God wants us to live in. What about your mind? Do you find yourself forgetting things? Again, we're going to look in the scriptures and we're going to see where we're blessed. I found a scripture that was extremely exciting to me. I already know the scripture that says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. I believe that my mind can be sound no matter what age I'm, I'm at. My, my mind can be sound, but I found a scripture uh, in Proverbs 10, 7, that says the memory of the righteous is blessed. The memory of the righteous is blessed. Praise God, my memory is blessed because I am re, uh, righteous. I don't begin to declare, oh, you know, I'm old and it's to be expected that I should forget things. No, it's not. The word says that he renews my youth like the eagles. When uh, they went into the promised land, it talked about... Uh, uh, Moses was or Moses didn't go in the promised land, but as he was getting older, it talked about that his eyesight did not dim, was not dimmed. And it talked about Caleb. Caleb came and said, give me this mountain. His strength was not abated. And so we can see the blessing of the Lord. Well, I'm just, I don't see it. Stop waiting to see, begin to declare it over yourself. I am creating with my words, just like God. I'm creating with my words. I am blessed because it's truth. So let's read some scriptures that the, the word talks about us being blessed so that we know it's already a done thing. Deuteronomy 28. All these blessings will, cover, will come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord. Blessed shall you be in the city and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body. Bless your body. Bless your body. Bless your body. God says our bodies are blessed. The fruit of our body, the produce of our ground, and the increase of our herds, the increase of our cattle, and the offspring of our flocks. Okay, they were mostly shepherds. So we can look that as, as blessing upon our job, blessing upon the things that we put our hands to, that it increases and becomes more. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. Uh, the Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be de de defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way, and they shall flee before you seven ways. See the blessing? See the multiplication? The enemy comes one way but has to flee seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouses. Shall we say investments? Shall we say savings accounts? And in all to which you set your hand, everything that I'm doing, my job, my the raising of my children, God is going, the Lord is going to command the blessing. And he will bless me in the land which the Lord is giving me. I believe the Lord gives us our land where we put our feet, where we're settled, where he establishes us in a home, in a church community, in a, in a city, that, that uh, our land is blessed, not only for us, but for the city as well. Psalm 1.1 says, Blessed is the person who does not follow the advice of wicked people, take the path of sinners, or join the company of mockers. That's me, so I'm blessed. Psalm 29.11, The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. I'm blessed with peace. Uh, Psalms 32, 1 and 2. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. That's me. My transgression is forgiven. So I'm blessed. See, we're blessed already. Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. I trust in the Lord. I'm blessed. Psalm 44, 40, verse 4. Blessed is that man who makes the Lord his trust and does not respect the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. I trust the Lord, so I'm blessed. Psalm 41, 1 and 2. Blessed is he who considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive, and he will be blessed on the earth. You will not deliver to him to the will of his enemies. I'm blessed. Blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits, the God of our salvation. Psalm 68, 19. 
daily. I'm blessed, loaded with his benefits, loaded, not just have one or two. I'm loaded with his benefits. Psalm 84 verses 4, 5, and 12. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. Selah, think about it. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage, O Lord of hosts. Blessed is the man who trusts in you. I trust in the Lord. I'm blessed. Psalm 94, 12. Blessed is the man in, in whom... Blessed is the man whom you instruct, O Lord, and teach out of your Lord, out of your law. The Lord instructs me. I'm blessed. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. His descendants will be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Will be blessed. Not may, but will be blessed. That is Psalms 112, 1 and 2. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm blessed, Psalm 119. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. I seek after God. I seek him with my whole heart. I'm blessed. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his way, Psalm 128.1. Uh, here's that scripture I read to you in Proverbs 10.7. The, the memory of the righteous is blessed. Praise God. By the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted. But it is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked, Proverbs 11, 11. Because you and I are blessed, it says that the city is exalted. So you see, our cities, our nation count on us being blessed so that they can be exalted. See, God is so good that, the, that those that aren't even him are blessed to have the righteous around them. Praise God. Proverbs 28 20 says, a faithful man will abound with blessings, but he who hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. A faithful man will abound with blessings. I love it. God wants it full and running over. Then in Matthew 5, we have the, um, uh, where Jesus uh, gave the Beatitudes and he talked about blessed are the poor in spirit. And he goes down the list, blessed, 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 blessed again and again. And then here's one I love. I love this. John 20, verse 29. Jesus is speaking to Thomas. Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. And he said, but blessed is the man. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You know what? There are things that I believe that I have yet to see. And I'm blessed because of that. Isn't that wonderful? So you see, we're blessed. We are blessed. We're already blessed. We're not waiting for the Lord to bless us. It's already happened. Romans 4, 7, and 8. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. That's me. And whose sins are covered. That's me. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. That is me. I'm blessed. Blessed. Ephesians 1, 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, who has blessed, past tense, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Praise God. We're blessed. We're blessed. Then it tells us that if we're reproached for the name of Christ, we're blessed in, in um 1 Peter 4, 14. And in James 1 and 12, it tells us that if we endure temptation, that we're blessed. And then the last scripture I want to read is in Revelation 1, 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the word of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it. We're blessed just to read the book of Revelation. So you see, we are blessed over, over, over and over again, blessed, blessed, blessed. Go away from today. Take away from you that you are blessed. Take away from me that you are blessed. Doesn't matter what it looks like. Doesn't matter what the enemy's telling you. The word of God tells us differently. And we choose to believe the word of God over what anything else would want to tell us. We are blessed. I am blessed, aren't you?